Hello everyone, Mark here, and this is episode one of our Training in Japan series. Um, we're going to start the series essentially by asking, um, I, I think, a, a very important question uh, that doesn't necessarily seem to be asked enough. Uh, should you train in Japan? Should you invest time, money, and effort in, uh, but then, you know, basically preparing a trip, making the trip, and training into a Japanese dojo. Uh, some personalities are, 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 are not compatible with classical martial art practice or, or daitoyu practice. Uh, and throughout the years, I've seen a number of people that would enter the dojos I would be training in, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be clashing necessarily very strongly but it would be awkward and ultimately i don't think that many of those people that that i met that that basically with whom there were some friction to a certain degree or basically you know an incompatibility i don't think those people really got what they were coming to to find and that probably means that they invested a lot of time and money for little to potentially no benefit so uh, to, to be clear, you know, when we're going to be talking about character traits, uh, I don't mean to say that, you know, not having one of those character traits ma makes you a bad person. Um, what I mean is that it might actually be something that you wish to develop to a certain degree or, or, or make sure that it's, you know, and, and be honest with yourself, all right, uh, that, that, you ha yeah, that you actually fit that character traits beforehand. Uh, so to make sure that you know you give yourself the best chances possible to make pr uh, to 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 go through to to, to enjoy the fruits of a uh, practice in, in in Japanese dojo. Uh, the second half is going to be about a few additional advices, things that you should do before you seriously consider making a trip to Japan. Uh, that I think you know some have fallen in the past but not not enough and that uh you should really keep in mind before perhaps jumping feet first into you know traveling to japan and and, and just you know starting to train in, in the dojo so let's get started uh first character trait i want to discuss is open-mindedness um even if you've read a lot on daitoryu in japanese culture um you have I don't think I've ever met anyone that came to Japan and said, oh, this is exactly how I thought it would be. Um, unless they were basically uh, bordering delusion. Uh, most people are going to tell you this is just so different. It's, it's, it's hard to describe, right? And it's not that it's, you know, a crazy place necessarily. There's some craziness, but... Uh, it's just a very different and unique culture, and um, it, it's very easy to 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 miss some of the subtleties sometimes. And missing the subtleties makes it so that uh, you might have a hard time explaining to yourself uh, certain situations you're going to get into or, or or certain things you're going to see. Um, you will want to make sure that you have an open mind about you know, trying to truly understand the culture uh, if you if you want to understand the people and if you, if you want to fully enjoy any sort of pra cultural practice in Japan. That, of course, includes Daitoryu. Um, keep in mind that, you know, y you're not going to go to a dojo and, and basically say, oh, this is what I want to learn, per se. Um, you know, you, you're obviously going to have your own motivations, but what you're going to get out of the dojo is is probably going to be something you're going to figure out along the way. Uh, for myself, I, I, all I can tell is that I ended up going to Japan mostly based on an intuition that there was something more that I wouldn't be able to access uh, just by continuing tra uh, training in my home country. And that was despite the fact I was training under somebody who lived in Japan for 10 years and had graduated from a Japanese university, was fully fluent, um, you know, 
extremely knowledgeable about the culture and, you know, well-versed in Daito Ryu. Um, so it's very important uh, to, to understand that, that, you know, maybe you're not going to find what you're looking for and you have to be open to what you might end up finding because it might still be of value to you. It might actually fit in what you're, in the kind of things that would be interesting to you. Um, it's also important, and I, 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 I specify this because I think most people don't have Daito Ryu at the, as their first martial art practice. Uh, you need to, to put the other practices aside. Uh, fun story, on my first trip to Japan, uh, I was invited at the, uh, the uh, headquarters uh, for the, the old head headquarters for the Yashinkan Dojo uh, in uh, Shin Nakano. And I, I did basically three or four trainings in, in, in Yoshinkan Aikido. Uh, and then after that, I went to a Daito Ryu Dojo. And the first thing, and I didn't, I wasn't doing anything on purpose, but the first thing I was told is, stop doing Yoshinkan Aikido. You're here to train in Daito Ryu. Not that it's bad, not that it's a bad practice, but if you, you know, the, the logic is simple. If you go to another dojo, you pra you're there to practice what they're, they're teaching you. And so... Um, it doesn't really make sense to just carry over whatever practice you've done somewhere else, uh, and, and and basically you know just continuing doing that. You might as well just stay at the place we're training and, and get direction from 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 the instructor at that place, right? Um, it's also important to have an open mind because the interpretation that you have of and the understanding that you have of the practice is going to evolve over time. Um, so, go, reaching a point where you feel that you've basically squeezed out all the juice out of something, especially with the basic stuff. A lot of people basically might end up feeling after a few months that, oh, well, you know, the basic things I understand now, I, and it's okay, and I just have to do them mindlessly. Um, that's not how you should approach the practice. And... You know, open-mindedness is also accepting the fact that, well, yes, you will, you'll, ma you'll mature, but your your understanding of things is never really final, uh, and you should be mindful in practice to to make sure that you know you get you give yourself the chance of catching all little details. All right, second character point, uh, trait that I think is 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 essential is is maturity. Um, like there's a lot of people that come to Japan and they walk into a dojo and they have this um, romantic view of, well, it's a classical, traditional, authentic martial arts. So it's going to be some samurai ninja kind of thing. It's that attitude, that, that perspective on things is very counterproductive, um, you know, or, or basically, you know, speaking about, you know, things like Regi and, and in a very romantic way that's, you know, just pretty protocol, basically, is not, I think, very productive, right? Um, it it kind of goes back to the don't assume anything, you know, take the, take the perspective that you don't really know much about things, uh, but, but, you know, having this romanticized view of a practice and, and assuming that it's going to be that it, it is not really useful uh, it, it goes to this, uh, it's the same also with the uh, people who kind of have a war machine syndrome i'm not sure how i could phrase it better but basically you probably know the type the, the individual that's always boasting that you know they want to learn something because it's for the streets for the battlefield um you know in in many ways, basically, it is true martial skill uh, and not some uh, artsy fartsy practice, right? You no, know, their war is not mine. Um, that's not productive either. Um, you're you're. I would argue, and then really, that's that's really what it boils down to. But I would argue that people who uh, their profession depends on, on martial skills. Uh, really, rarely have that attitude, uh, 
and it's not a productive one to, to have in any dojo, let alone the, in a Daitoryu dojo. Um, Daitoryu is a serious practice, and it needs to be undertaken by serious people. Um, and you know, if you if you if you have a kind of immature standpoint regarding Japan, and you know, kind of a romantic view, or you 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 you, you see martial skills as being just pure aggression and violence, then chances are you're going to be very disappointed in title of practice. Um, you have to come in and, you know, accept the fact that you're going to learn, or at least you have to be open to the idea of learning things that go outside of your, your point of view and understand how they can have a certain concreteness to them. Uh, beyond just you know very um very na narrow-minded uh in lack of a better world uh perspective uh character point uh, character trait number three uh being reserved and humble um in, in japan you know it's generally the cons the, the 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 general attitude by most people is to try to be the gray man. Uh, you don't really want to stand stand out, right? The the nail that stands that that stands out is the first one to get struck. Um, and as a foreigner, you're go and as, most likely as a clumsy foreigner who doesn't speak the language and doesn't fully understand the culture, you're already gonna gonna stand out. And if you do speak the language and understand the culture, you're probably still just gonna stand out because of your physique, essentially, right? You no. Know, uh, so to add to that, to basically make yourself stand out even further by, you know, bragging about being somebody who's trained for a very long time or, um, you know, saying that you've trained in many martial arts uh, or, or just, you know, trying to you know, do some chest thumping and, and, and you know, in... in, in more ways than one kind of demonstrate toughness is really not likely going to be seen uh, positively. Um, as in, whether you're Japanese or a foreigner, your job when you enter a dojo uh, is to basically accept that you're part of an apprenticeship. And by and large, your job is going to be to shut up, learn, and really ask questions on, uh, on, uh, only if it's really necessary right and in, in this in this and what i mean by that is ask a question when you've pondered the question seriously and you, you you're sure that you're not going to be asking something that's kind of obvious on its own or or is something you can realize by just you know going through the motion and, and through the practice um if you wish to cultivate humility you have to have some humility to start with basically right um a lot of the times you're gonna you hear you know stories of you know people going to a dojo because they feel they lack in humility or they're gonna put their their children in the dojo because they want to teach them humility. Well, that that's something important to keep in mind. If you don't have some amount of humility to start with, it's gonna be a little bit hard to get you started on that path. Uh, it will grow through practice because you're gonna you're you're gonna go through. Um, you know, humbling moments for sure, but you have to be already a little bit humble in the first place to be able to recognize those moments. Uh, and finally, character trait number four, uh, you need a bit of a thick skin. Um, and, and I don't mean that you need to be tough. I mean that you need to be able to accept some bruises to your ego. Um, you're going to get told a lot. Um, and you know, doing some really simple, basic tasks, um, and you might actually start at some point, and perhaps very quickly and early in your practice, to start to feel like you're not even able to do the simplest thing, and that's okay. Uh, that's fine. There, there's really no problem with that, even though some instructors might actually lose patience a bit with you and you know give you a stern look or you know might they they're, they're not going to scream nobody's going to scream at you or or be 
you know, physical or anything like that, but, you know, they'll, they'll make you feel like, okay, the, the, why aren't you figuring this out uh, yet, right? And it's, it's going to be tough on your ego. And, you know, the only thing you can really do is either, you know, give up or, or deal with it. Uh, and what I'm here to tell you is just, you'll be fine. You can deal with this. It's not a problem. Just get over yourself, basically, right? Don't don't let, you know, repeated failure over what might be days, weeks, or months, you know, take you down. Um, don't accept it. Uh, don't don't be okay with it. But at the same time, don't don't let it, you know, bring uh, bring you down to the point where you know you you start to feel diminished as a human being. Right? It's okay. Don't 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 feel too bad. Right? And that's what I mean by having a thick skin. Uh, those four character traits I think are really important because once you go to Japan, and especially if you uh, like myself, do the traveling on your own, uh, meaning not as part of a group or, or you know, associated with, with anybody else, um, you'll need those character traits. And uh, I'm saying this not only out of personal experience, but also seeing other people going through the motion, some who were able to overcome uh, some of their personal you know, quirks, others who just you know, never have and, and they just gave up basically um and there those are all elements that are going to be important as part of you know engaging in japan with individuals in the japanese culture and more specifically you know engaging with people in, in a budo practice context now if you think that those four character traits are a good fit for you, or you think that you know you can develop them, then there's still going to be a few things you're going to want to do before you make the trip to Japan. Uh, the first one is you should really consider training locally in a local dojo in your area. Um, there might not be one. Try to find one that's as close to you as possible. Reach out to them, ask if it would be okay to train. You know, if you can go weekly, try to ask if you could go at least once a month or try to work out some training arrangement. Um, it's fine if you want to go and straight up start in Japan. I would advise against it unless you're already living in Japan, already know the language and are familiar with the basic, you know, cultural customs. Otherwise, you're basically kind of going to learn, you're going to have too much to learn at the same time. And whatever time you're going to spend in the dojo is not going to be too. It's not really going to be productive. Uh, I've seen people get creative and kind of try to hire um, like uh, interpreters or try to basically palliate to the lack of culture of uh, language skill by you know in some way or another. That that's not going to work. You know, if you if you have an interpreter, chances are it's basically somebody that's going to be okay for general Japanese conversation, not necessarily for Budo conversation. Uh, there, there's things that are still going to go over your head. There's things that are going to most likely go over the interpreter's head. Things are going to get lost in translation, uh, and it's going to be super quirky. Just not something you want to do, and it doesn't really look all that serious, to be quite honest, uh, to, to do so. Um, training locally first also has a number of key advantages. It will allow you to get to know local practitioners, some of whom might have traveled to Japan and be able to tell you a bit about their own stories and, and, and you know, give you a few advices. Um, it will allow you to, uh, once you reach the point where, you know, you, you've done this for a while and uh, you're, you're, you really feel like you have a good reason to go to train in Japan. Well, you know, having in your, uh, a recommendation from the group chief of, or, or branch chief or being recommended by a uh, current practitioner is always a good thing, right? Uh, we're going to get to this in the next episode, but you will need to basically reach out to whatever dojo. If you go to the home dojo, you're going to need to reach out to them ahead of time. Uh, and, and, you know, having being introduced is, is always a good thing, right? You know, uh, a lot of the practice and a lot of the culture is about human interaction and human connection. Um, like in anything else, you know, being recommended is always a good thing. Uh, you might also get the chance to just hop along on, on one of the groups trip uh, there are certain there's many groups who will come at least once a year for uh, the uh, special training sessions that happen in August um, so that's one opportunity you will have 
Other groups come more frequently, two to three times a year, depending on the group and depending on generally the branch chief. Um, and so you're going to be able to ask whether you know, you're going to be able to request to jump on one of those trips at some point. Uh, and this obviously makes things a lot easier because now you're you're going to Japan with somebody who has been most likely to Japan before. Um, it, it will make the learning curve a little bit less uh, steep. Um, second thing you'll want to do is learn the general culture, not just Japanese, not just Budo culture, and learn the language. Um, it, it kind of amazes me sometimes when I meet uh, long-time practitioners of Japanese martial art that don't have a Japanese culture that really go beyond the narrow microculture that they're part of. And the problem with that is that it will will give you a narrow view on things. Um, Japanese practitioners and, and the, just the practice in general is to be understood mostly, at the very least, through the prism and scope of general Japanese culture. And most of the time, you're going to have to also get a good understanding of, you know, specific eras of Japanese history and what kind of mindset and culture existed at that time as well. And, you know, regardless of the era we're speaking of, you know, you're not going to be able to really reach a full under understanding of it if you don't have a good understanding of the modern culture and of the language. Uh, not only that, beyond that, if you go to a dojo and you can only ask questions in English, well, I'm sure somebody's going to be able to translate for you, but chances are the questions you're going to be able to ask and get a productive answer to are going to be pretty basic. If you are in it for the mid to long run and you are serious about practice, uh, practicing, you'll want to be able to ask the questions on your own terms. And that's going to be very important to, to do for your own development. And you won't really be able to do it unless you have some level of Japanese, I think. Um, point, uh, third point here, the third things you really ought to consider doing and that you, in my opinion, should be doing, uh, do homework, do your homework, right? So obviously, if you're learning language, you need to set aside some time for learning language, but also study the history of the tradition and its culture, right? So once you have a good general understanding of, J of the Japanese culture, Try to ask for reading material, you know, good books, maybe some good DVDs to to uh, to to learn about Daitoryu, right? Uh, also, start a diary. This is something I didn't do, and I wish I had uh, when I started. Um, there's a lot of questions that you're not necessarily going to get a satisfactory answer to early on in your your practice, and you might actually want to ask them maybe a few times actually to to, to try to get an answer that makes sense to you. Uh, there's also going to be, again, like I mentioned, an evolving understanding of your practice and having some notes will help you to be more mindful of, you, of your practice and, you know, of the evolution that it will undergo. And last point to consider, it's not necessarily something really to do per se, but uh, be honest with yourself about your level of commitment. Um, you know, it's certainly impressive uh, for for some that you might have the will to go and train in Japan. You know, it might show some will, but if you're not even going to pursue Daitoryu seriously in your home country, what reason do you have to believe that you're going to be sufficiently serious to practice it in, in Japan in another country, right? Uh, given all the barriers you're going to have to go through before you actually can even get there. Um, it's, it's really just a gut check. Uh, I'm not saying, and I'm not even saying that you need to be somebody that, uh, will train five days a week, seven days a week, five hours a day kind of person. Uh, initial practice does have its own requirement, I think, in terms of, you know, intensity. Uh, but at the very least, you know, be honest about it. Um, and be honest with others about it as well. If you're, if you contact the local dojo and you say straight up like, oh, I want to go and, and train really hard so that I can prepare to go to Japan and then give up halfway, it, it doesn't re really reflect well in your character. Or if you basically say you're going to tr train really seriously and you really only end up showing once every two months, um, you know, what does it say about you, right? 
so those are the, the four things that I think are kind of prerequisite things to do, basically, before you, you go to Japan. Making sure that you have, you know, a good uh, character fit for Japanese martial arts, Japanese classical martial arts, and, and I told you. And making sure that you engage in those, uh, those activities before you start to seriously consider making a trip to Japan are essential so that when you do make the preparation and when and ultimately end up starting your training in a Japanese dojo, well, you're going to be able to uh, you're going to be able to have confidence that you're there for all the right reasons and that your practice is going to be as productive as you, you can make it. Uh, in the next episode, we're going to be discussing preparation for our first trip, the kind of communications you, you need to do, uh, the kind of preparations that's required, and how you know the train you can expect the train to basically go in the first few times you, you go there. Um, if you have any questions or comments about this video, don't hesitate to put them down in the comments. Thank you for your time, and until next time.